from Toronto, Canada. My name is Yuri Selvanov. I'm co-founder of Magic Stack. Uh, check out our website. It's uh, magic.io. Uh, I'm an avid Python user since 2008. I think the first Python version I, st uh, I started to use actually was Python 2, but then in the months I switched to Python 3. I used it since Alpha 2 or something and never looked back. So use Python 3. Uh, I'm C Python core developer since 2013, uh, but I believe I actually started to, uh, to do things even before that. Uh, you might know me from uh, PEP 362, which I co-authored with uh, Larry Hastings and Brett Cannon. It's uh, Inspect Signature API. Uh, then I have, uh, then I've created PEP 492. That's uh, async await uh, that we have in Python 3.5. And I'm also helping Guida and Victor Steiner to maintain async.io. I also created UV loop. Uh, more on that later. Uh, structure of the stocks. I actually wanted to talk you, to tell you so much about uh, how to write high performance code in Python and in async, with async.io in particular. Uh, but unfortunately, I had to cut my, my, my slides. Like, like, I don't know, 50% uh, of my slides uh, had to go. Uh, so. Uh, We'll briefly start uh, with uh, an overview of uh, async await. Uh, then we'll quickly cover async IO and UV loop. Uh, then we'll answer or try to answer a question uh, how you should write your protocols, how you should implement them using sockets or protocols, or maybe you should use streams. Uh, then I'll present you with something new. Uh, it's a new high performance driver that I open sourced like two hours ago. Uh, and then we'll recap. Uh, I have to say that there will be no funny cat slides, uh, just because performance is hard. So only sad and depressed cards, uh, cats uh, from now on. So let's start. Uh, there should be just one obvious way to do it, right? Uh, so we have five different ways to do coroutines in Python. Uh, first one is uh, to do callbacks and deferreds. I think Twisted actually started uh, and originated this approach, one of the first uh, major frameworks, at, at least, uh, that use that and kind of validated that it is possible. Uh, then we have stackless Python and greenlets. And I'm pretty sure everybody heard about eventlet and gevent. Uh, that's a good example of frameworks that, that use them. Uh, in short, the uh, they, uh, programs in gevent look like, look like normal programs. Uh, in, they kind of look like you are using threads, but instead, uh, it's, it's just one program, one thread, and every point of your code can actually suspend and then resume. It's, it's a lot of dark magic, and uh, as Guido said, it, it will never be merged in, in CPython, so uh, those guys are kind of on their own. Uh, then we have yield, and uh, it was possible to, to, to use uh, generators um, as coroutines in Python since, I believe, Python uh, 2.5 uh, or something, and uh, uh, Twisted uh, has a decorator called inline callbacks so that you can kind of implement modern looking code uh, using coroutines uh, in Twist and you could do, the, could do this for years. Then in Python 3.3, uh, yield from was introduced and async, uh, async IO benefits from it. Uh, that's, that's how most of the async IO code is written using yield from. And then in Python 3.5, uh, we have async await. That's, that's the new way. Uh, and why do I think that async await is the answer? Well, first of all, it's a dedicated syntax for coroutines. It's concise and readable. Uh, it, it's, it's easy to actually glance over a large chunk of code and see what's, what's actually going on. You will never confuse coroutines and, and generators. Um, there is now a new built-in type for coroutines. It's actually the first time in Python history that we have a new dedicated built-in type just for coroutines. Uh, we also have new uh, concepts, async for and async with, and I believe this is something rather unique to Python. Uh, when we added async and await, a lot of people actually told us, well, you copied it from C-sharp. Well, yes, we copied it from the C-sharp, but we also introduced new things, and I believe this kind, uh, async for and async with, are kind of unique. Uh, like, I, I, I haven't seen any other imperative language that, that has this, this construct. Uh, async await, uh, is also a generic concept. Uh, a lot of people think that async await can, all, can only work with uh, async.io. That's not true, actually. Uh, async.io uses async await, but 
you can build entirely new framework and, and, and use them on your own. Uh, that's, for instance, what David Beasley did with his framework called Curio. Uh, he uses async await in a completely different way from how async await is used uh, in async I.O. And also async await are, uh, it's, it's fast. Uh, if you write something like a Fibonacci calculator, uh, you will see that uh, it will run just twice slower. And, and, and that is fine, actually, because in, even in big async I.O. programs, you don't have as much async await calls as you have normal function calls. It's, it's, you, you cannot even compare. It's like 100 times more. So use async await as much as possible. It won't hurt your performance. You, you, won't, you won't see any, uh, any drawbacks. So uh, coroutines are subtype of, uh, of generators, but not in the classical uh, Pythonic sense. Uh, in, in Python, they share uh, the same C struct layout. Uh, they share like 99% of the implementation, uh, but uh, coroutine is not a, an, an instance of a generator, actually. And uh, you, can, you can see this. Uh, uh, the sharing of the machinery, uh, if you, if, if you for, for example, disassemble a coroutine, you will see that it still uses yield from uh, opcode. Um, then we have types coroutine. Originally, we, we introduced it to uh, make old style yield from coroutines from async IO compatible with new coroutines that uses async await syntax. Uh, because you cannot just await on things. You, you can only await on awaitable objects. Uh, so you cannot await on number one, and you cannot await on a generator. But if you wrap a generator in with a uh, type's coroutine decorator, uh, you can await on it, actually. And again, David Beasley uses this kind of creatively in Curio. I, if, if you are interested in async await, I definitely recommend you to take a look at how async IO is implemented and how Curio is implemented, just to compare it to different approaches. Um, and then we have a bunch of protocols for async uh, iterators and uh, async context managers. Let's move on. Uh, let's talk about async IO, libuv, Cython, and uvloop. So async IO is uh, developed by Guido himself originally. I think a lot of it is inspired by Twisted. Um, uh, and and it's, it's, it's actually good because Twisted existed for, I don't know, 20 years or something, and they validated that, that this concept of asynchronous programming in Python actually works. So uh, I think we, we copied quite a lot from Twisted, and Twisted actually plans to, to use async.io at some point when they fully mi migrate to Python 3, they will just use uh, async.io event loop. Uh, a lot of people call async.io a framework. Well, it's not a framework. Uh, I, I, would, I would call it a toolbox, actually. Uh, it doesn't implement HTTP, for instance, or any other high-level protocols. It just provides uh, the machinery and APIs for you to develop this, this kind of stuff. If you want HTTP, you probably would use AAU HTTP for that. Uh, if you want uh, a memcache driver, you, you, you go and Google it. Uh, and it's also a part of standard library, which is both good and bad. Uh, why is it bad? Python has slow release cadence. Uh, we see uh, new Python major releases uh, every year and a half, and uh, bug fix releases usually are uh, half a year apart. Uh, and I would say that for async IO, sometimes it's not enough. Sometimes we discover bugs and we want to fix them as soon as possible, but we have to stick with the um, Python release cycle. But it's also good because uh, because you kind of know that async IO will, uh, will stay with us for a while. It will be supported by someone always uh, because it's a part of the standard library. Uh, and also, Python has a huge network of, uh, of build bots with different architectures and different uh, operating systems. And it's quite important, actually, to test something as uh, convoluted and as hard as IO uh, on, on different platforms. So it's good. Async IO is... Uh, <laughs> Uh, is quite stable right now and will be uh, even more stable uh, pretty soon. So what's inside AsyncIO? So we have a standardized and pluggable event loop. Uh, actually, AsyncIO from the beginning was, was envisioned in a way that you can swap uh, the event loop implementation with something different. Uh, it, has, uh, it defines uh, protocols and transports. Uh, that's one way to uh, actually marry uh, callback style programming and, uh, and async await is to actually develop uh, protocols using uh, low level primitives such as protocols. It also has factories for uh, 
servers and connections and streams. And this is also quite important because if you implement a server, uh, let's say using, uh, using blocking sockets, uh, you implement it once and then you start to implement it a second time, you will see that you have lots and lots of boilerplate code that kind of looks, looks the same every time. So async IO takes care of that and factors out all of this implementation and convenient helpers for creating servers and creating connections. It also defines features and tasks. Tasks are, uh, tasks, uh, task is something that actually runs the coroutine, that pushes the value into coroutines, that suspends them and resumes them. Uh, in a framework independent way, it's called coroutine wrapper, uh, coroutine runner, actually. Uh, and features, features allow you to, uh, uh, to interface with callbacks. Uh, that's, that's how you actually, uh, uh, introduce async await into something that uses callbacks. Uh, it also uh, has uh, interfaces for uh, creating uh, sub uh, and communicating with sub-processes asynchronously. It has queues, and by the way, queue is is a very useful class. You should you should definitely use it. It's it's exceptionally hard to create an asynchronous queue that. Uh, supports cancellation stuff, all, all, all the stuff like that without without bugs. Like we, we still fixed a lot of queue bugs in 3.5.2. Uh, uh, so uh, queues are useful for things like connection pools, for instance. Uh, de definitely check it out. And we also have flux, uh, events, uh, semaphores, everything like that. Everything that everybody, nobody knows how to use actually. Uh, and uh, as Lukas Lange said on, on his talk on PyCon US a couple of months ago, if you, if you love deadlocks, you can still have them in async.io. Uh, so event loop is the foundation. It's, it's the engine that actually uh, writes, uh, that actually uh, execute async.io code. It also, uh, it also provides factories for tasks and futures. It's also an IO multiplexer, that the engine that actually uh, reads the data and pushes the data to the wire. Uh, it provides APIs for uh, low-level low APIs for scheduling callbacks, for scheduling timed events, uh, for working with sub-processes and handling Unix uh, signals. And the best part about it is that you can replace it. So uh, that's what we kind of did with UV loop. UV loop is 99.9% .9 compatible with async.io. Uh, I'm not aware of any incompatibilities, but uh, maybe there are some. Uh, as far as I know, you can drop in UV loop in pretty much any program and it will just work. Uh, it's written in Cython, and by the way, Cython is just amazing. In, uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, it's not as widespread, and I, th I think it's, it's kind of underappreciated what you can do in Cython. Essentially, it's a superset of Python language. You can, use, uh, str you, you can strictly type it and it will compile to C, and uh, you will have C speed. You, you, you can easily achieve it with a syntax closer to Python. So definitely check out Python and try to, uh, Cython and try to use it. Uh, UVLoop uses libuv. Libuv is something that uh, keeps Node.js running, actually. Node.js uses lib, uh, libuv uh, as its event loop. Uh, and uh, it's actually a good thing because Node.js is, is super widespread uh, and it's, it's, it's very, very well tested. So libuv is stable and it's fast. It also provides fast uh, tasks and futures. Uh, so even your async await code runs faster on UV loop uh, by about 30%. And it's also thanks to libuv and a few hacks, uh, it's, it's, it's super it has super fast I.O. So how fast is UV loop? Well, compared to async IO, it's two to four times faster uh, on simple benchmarks like echo server. Uh, again, nobody, nobody probably deploys echo servers uh, in, in real life, so as soon as you add more uh, and more Python code, uh, it, of course it will become slower. Uh, but again, uh, in, even in real applications, uh, I've seen reports that, async, uh, that UV loop runs code about 30% faster. And also the latency distribution is much better with UV loop. Uh, so it's faster than async.io. What about other uh, platforms and, and frameworks? For instance, the same echo server uh, written in Python that uses, and, and, uh, which uses UV loop is two times faster than Node.js. And it's kind of interesting because Node.js uh, is itself written mostly in V8. Uh, that's the JavaScript implementation. Uh, it uses libuv, which is written in C, and there is a thin layer of JavaScript uh, on top of it. So still, UV loop that uses the same libuv is two times faster for the same, almost the same amount of code. 
Uh, it is as fast as Go, uh, run with uh, Go max, max, max prox uh, uh, set to one. That essentially means that Go cannot parallelize uh, on multiple CPU the, lo uh, the, the load. Uh, but still, it's, it's, it's quite an impressive, uh, impressive result because Go is, is like a fully compiled language and it also has, uh, I think, a bit more efficient uh, implementation of I.O. Uh, than, than LibUV, just because LibUV is trying to be generic. It supports uh, Windows, it supports, um, uh, supports Unix, and Golang supports it too, but in slightly different way. Anyways, uh, let's, and, and of course, it's much uh, faster than Twisted and Tornado, uh, just because it's, it, it uses, a lot, a lot of it is in C, like most of you loop is in C. So uh, initially my idea for, for this talk was to end with this slide, just use UV loop. Uh, thank you for your time, questions. But unfortunately, uh, unfortunately it's not that easy. So uh, part three, let's talk about sockets, streams, and protocols. That's basically one obvious way to do it, episode two. So what should you choose? Should you use uh, coroutines like uh, socks and all, sock receive, uh, sock connect, or should you use high level streaming API? Or maybe you should, uh, use lower, uh, low level protocols and transfers. Uh, here is uh, uh, an echo server implemented with loop SOC methods and if you uh, look at it closely, you will see that if you kind of drop async and await key, uh, keywords, it looks like, like a normal blocking code that, that, wor uh, that uses uh, the socket module. Um, so uh, it is kind of convenient when you have lots and lots of code and old style code, blocking code, uh, you can kind of easily uh, uh, convert it to async and await. Um, here are streams. Here is the streams version um, of the echo server. Uh, it's, 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 quite, uh, it's quite high level, as you see. You, you, don't, you don't work with sockets anymore. You have reader and writer. Uh, and here is a low level uh, implementation of echo server using protocols. So essentially, protocol is something that uh, uh, the event loop just pushes the data in, and protocol has a transport to, pu to push the data back to the client, uh, to the server. So the key method here is data received. That's, that's like the main method. Uh, it, uh, the event loop pushes the data to the data received, then protocol can uh, process the data and then call transport.write uh, to actually send the, the process data or send, send a response back to the caller. Um, for echo server, it's, it's, it's quite a simple implementation, but you can imagine it gets pretty hairy for, uh, for more uh, complex protocols. So downsides. Uh, when you use low level uh, loop.sock uh, methods, loop cannot buffer for you. So you are responsible to, 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 to implement the buffering on top. Uh, and uh, you also have no flow control, which without buffers doesn't make any sense. You, you don't need flow control, but when you start implement the buffers, you won't have it. And it's quite a tricky thing to, to implement correctly. Um, and another thing why you, sh why you shouldn't use it is just because the event loop has no idea what are you doing right now. Let's say you are uh, reading some data. Okay, uh, event loop will, um, add your file descriptor to a selector, uh, which can be epoll or kq on, 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 on Unix, uh, and uh, essentially wait for, for an event, and when, uh, when it receives this event, it will try to read the data, push the data back to you, but it will also remove the file descriptor from the selector. That's an extra system call, um, because it doesn't know, will you continue reading the data, or will you, uh, will you write the data now? Or will you just stop? Or will you close the, close the connection? So it cannot predict uh, what, what's going on. When you use streams, and streams are, by the way, use, are, are using protocols, uh, event loop just knows because you, you, you have an intent. Just keep sending me data to my data received or to my stream. And when I, I don't need this data, I will close the connection myself. So event loop can actually optimize for that. And flow control is kind of important. <laughs> I, I like this picture because it illustrates that sometimes you, can, you kind of have to push back on something slow or something that you don't want to use uh, right now. So which API you should use? You should use uh, uh, loop.sock methods when, uh, when you are quickly prototyping something or when you are uh, 
um, porting uh, some existing code, but I would highly recommend you to actually stick to streams, uh, even uh, uh, for porting code, just rewrite it in streams, because streams are much easier to use. You can just say, give me exactly this amount of data, or you can uh, tell streams, read until you see slash n or uh, something like that, and it will do it. Uh, it also implements a buffer, uh, read and write buffers uh, quite, quite efficiently, and you can use async await to program the entire protocols with streams. Uh, and use protocols and transports uh, for performance, actually. Uh, if you want exceptional performance, you have to go, uh, you have to go low level. So uh, for this talk, let's, talk, let's focus on protocols and transports. And ag again, it's, it's kind of important. For your application code, you should always use async await. Never even touch, never think about transports, transports and protocols. This stuff is just for drivers drivers for PostgreSQL, for memcache, for Redis, for any kind of, uh, of, of this kind of code. High-level code should never think about protocols. Always use async await, it, it will be enough. So let's focus on protocols. So uh, as, as we mentioned before, uh, loop pushes data to protocols. Protocols send data back using transports. Uh, and protocols can implement specialized read and write buffers. Um, uh, they can also do flow control. Uh, you, they can uh, hint uh, the event loop or uh, through the uh, transport dot, uh, resume and pause uh, read methods. Uh, and you have full control over how I/O is performed. You you call transport dot write. You uh, can uh, pause or resume uh, data consumption. So you have you have you have tools to control the I/O. So how to use protocol and transports? Uh, there are basically two strategies. Uh, the first one is you implement your own abstractions, your own uh, buffering, buffering uh, and your own stream abstractions. Uh, and a good example of that is AIHTTP. That's, that's what they do. They have uh, buffers and, and streams specifically designed to handle and parse HTTP protocol, and then they, they just use async await. Uh, it's, it's a fine approach. It, it will be slower than using uh, than using callbacks and then accelerating everything in C, uh, but but it's it's quite it's quite good, still quite good. So the second strategy is to actually implement the the whole protocol parsing uh, in uh, in callbacks, uh, and then create a, create a facade that allows you to use async and await. And the main key reason why this uh, uh, why this is a better, might be a better strategy and why this can offer better performance is because you can uh, just drop Python completely. You can, you can go low level, you can use Cython, you can use C. So uh, part four, AsyncPG. Uh, this is something that I just open sourced a couple of hours ago. Uh, this is right now the fastest PostgreSQL driver for AsyncIO and for Python actually. It's two times faster than PsychoPG. Uh, it completely re-implements the, the, the protocol from ground up. It doesn't use libpq, that's the de facto library for uh, working with PostgreSQL. Uh, so we just implemented it completely uh, uh, from scratch. Uh, it uses Postgres uh, binary data format. And by the way, when you are implementing protocol and you have a choice, uh, use text or binary, always choose binary. It's easier to read binary. It's, it's usually just less data because the encoding is more efficient, and you can process it much faster. You can uh, because well, how binary formats works. Usually, you have uh, a length field that tells you how how much data uh, follows uh, this frame, and then you have another one. So you can read frames much faster. You can decode types much faster. So always choose binary. And also, not all Postgres uh, types can can be uh, encoded in text and actually decoded from text. So uh, small, uh, so uh, com uh, composite types, for instance. Uh, if you have a recursive composite type, it's just not possible to decode it in, in, in Psycho PG. Um, so, what, uh, so what we did for async PG, we actually forgot about DB API completely. Uh, there is no DB API for async await, but for instance, what AIO PG does, uh, they kind of sprinkle async and await on top of, uh, on top of existing uh, DB API. Uh, so our idea was let's 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 build a driver that just is tailored for uh, Postgres and uses Postgres features, uh, and we also support all uh, built-in uh, Postgres uh, types th th there is, uh, basically. So uh, 
Postgres loves prepared statements uh, because it, can, it, it, it doesn't need to actually parse the same query over and over again. When you prepare a statement, uh, it has basically some structure on the server with a plan, with a parsed query, and Postgres already know, knows how to accept your arguments and, and, and do this kind of stuff. So we use prepared statements every time, even when you don't explicitly create them, we have an LRU cache of, of prepared statements and we do that transparently for you. Uh, we also dynamically build pipelines for efficiently encoding and decoding, uh, decoding data. So uh, the pipeline is essentially an array of pointers to C functions that can process, process the stream like with enormous speed. So, uh, and it, it actually shows. Um, uh, this chart compares different uh, Postgres drivers for different languages. Uh, the fastest one is uh, AsyncPG. It manages to push uh, almost 900,000 uh, queries uh, um, to the server. Uh, the second one is AIOPG. Uh, that's another uh, driver that uses libpq, which is also is written in C. But unfortunately, PsychoPG doesn't uh, doesn't provide an efficient async interface, so so it's slower. And also, AsyncPG, uh, AIOPG, and uh, PsychoPG, they, they use text, pro, text data encoding, so, so it, it always will be slower. Uh, then you will see uh, two Go implementations, and then you will see uh, Node.js drivers, uh, which are just 10 times slower. Uh, the funny part about this one is that uh, Node.js PG is, is an actually pure JavaScript implementation of the driver, and uh, PG native is using libpq, so somehow uh, a lot of JavaScript is faster than, than C. Uh, I have no idea how. The funny thing about this performance is that there is another library. It's not a part of this chart because it's, it's kind of slow. Uh, it's called PyPostgreSQL. Nobody knows about it. We used it for <laughs> several years and then uh, we just uh, uh, created a sync page. Anyways, it's a pure Python implementation uh, and it's as fast as uh, pure JavaScript implementation. So uh, everybody is saying that Python is slower than JavaScript. You, should, you, shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't use it. But we, we kind of saw that it's possible to write a pure Python code that as fast as Node.js code, so uh, maybe uh, Python isn't that slow. Uh, so um, uh, AsyncPG uh, architecture, uh, it's basically implemented in, uh, the, the meat of it is implemented in core protocol. Core protocol is something written in Cython. It uses callbacks to process the, the protocol. Then uh, we have a protocol class that just wraps uh, core protocol and uh, insert some future objects into it so that you can use async await. And the rest of uh, async PG is just pure Python implementation that uh, just implements the high level, uh, the high level API. So how, how would you parse parse uh, Postgres protocol? Naive approach would be just to use Python bytes and memory views. Uh, but unfortunately, doing so will cause will cause a lot of Python objects to be created and you will, you will actually see how, how long you spend uh, memory, uh, on, on memory allocation. So the solution is to use Cython and go, uh, go to the C, uh, C, C types uh, and, and, and just don't even touch uh, Python, uh, uh, Python bytes and, and memory views. So this is a uh, preview of read buffer. It's, it's, it's a bit bigger than this, the, it's, it's API, but you can see the, the first method is the most important, feed data. That's what uh, protocol data received actually calls protocol data received has just two lines in it. The first one pushes the data to read buffer and the second one calls a function that just reads from the buffer. And this buffer is kinda uh, tailored for Postgres protocol. It has uh, low level read uh, in 32, uh, in uh, 16, and th the second most important uh, call here is uh, try read bytes. Try read bytes either returns you uh, a low level uh, CC, uh, uh, data type or it returns a null pointer and if it returns a null pointer then you actually call uh, read which returns you a Python object uh, which is much slower but most of the time 99% of the time try read bytes succeeds and we can uh, we can avoid creating any Python objects so um, uh, again high level uh, high level logic of async PG is built in pure Python that is uh, how you can actually use it uh, uh, you can see it's a, it's a pretty high level, uh, high level API. We prepare a statement, we uh, enter a transaction with async with, and we iterate over a scrollable cursor. Part five, let's recap. So don't be afraid of protocols. Uh, use them to uh, implement really, really high performance drivers and use Python for, use Cython for low level code. 
it's really much easier to code in Cython than in C. You can uh, quickly refactor your code completely, change everything, and it will just work. Uh, async await should always be used in your application code. Don't think about protocols and transport. Use, use only high-level code. Uh, and again, once you have fast database drivers, memcache drivers, stuff like that, and you use UV loop, you will see, uh, you will see your application being much, much faster. Uh, loop create future was introduced in Python 3.5.2, actually, that's a new feature. With this, uh, if, you use, if you use loop create future, uh, UV loop can actually inject fast future implementation into your code because UV loop implements its own version of the future. And it's about 30% faster um, uh, than, than uh, I think IO uh, future. Always use binary protocols. Never, never even try to, uh, to parse text protocols. It does, doesn't make any sense. If you, if you can do binary, go binary. Um, always profile your code. It's actually funny because uh, when, uh, I f when async PG actually started to work, I benchmarked it against uh, AIO PG and it was two times slower. And I didn't understand why because it should be faster. Like, there, there is no way it can be slower. So I spent about 30 hours without sleep optimizing async PG and made it two times faster, no, four times faster. Uh, so uh, the, the important lesson from this is that if that first run uh, showed that uh, async PG was like 30% faster than AIO PG, then maybe I, I wouldn't spend so much time trying to optimize it. So always profile, uh, always uh, analyze, uh, and, and try to, 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 to push it forward. And by the way, Cython code can be profiled with wall grind, and you can visualize results in Kcache grind. It's a very useful tool. Uh, check it out. Um, and Cython has a useful flag. It's called dash "-a". Uh, it generates HTML representation of your source file, and each line is highlighted. Uh, uh, it's either blank or it's, uh, it's a shade of yellow. And the most yellow lines use more Python C API, Python C API and it, it is slow. So uh, basically, you have a quick way of analyzing your Cython code, uh, its, it's, it's speed. So definitely check out that option. Uh, always try to do zero copy. Try to avoid working with bytes, memory views, uh, all, 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 all this kind of stuff. Go low level uh, with Cython and, and don't copy Python objects, uh, never. Um, uh, and the, the, uh, one of the last advices, actually, is to uh, implement an efficient buffer uh, to write data. Uh, for instance, for async PG, what we do for uh, writing messages, we have a write buffer that just preallocates uh, a portion of memory, and then we compose messages in, uh, with high-level API, uh, and we, we, we don't touch this, that memory uh, uh, at all. And when the message is ready, we just send it. Uh, so we have high-level API of creating the message, but we don't allocate any memory while we are doing so. So when you have this uh, the, this, the, this this control, you you should definitely say set TCP no delay flag. We probably will set it by default uh, in async IO in Python 3.6. Uh, right now it's not set. You should do it because it will speed up transport dot write method. Uh, uh, basically, uh, we with this flag set on the socket, socket doesn't, doesn't wait until it receives a TCP arc message. It just sends the data as soon as you, uh, as, as you do it. But if you, have, if you don't have control over how, how frequently you are calling a transport that right, you can basically use TCP cork. What, what you do, you cork the channel, then you do multiple writes to it, then you uncork it, and it just sends all, your, all of your data in as few TCP pa packets as, as possible. And the last slide uh, is, is timeouts. Always implement timeouts as part of your API. Don't uh, ask your users to use uh, async, uh, async IO uh, wait for, because wait for is slow. It wraps the coroutine uh, into a task, and, and that, that, that comes with a huge penalty. Your code will, be, will become 30% uh, slower if you use wait for. So uh, design timeouts as part of your API. At the lower level, implement timeouts with uh, Loop dot uh, call later method, uh, and it will just work. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. So I think we have uh, time for maybe one or two questions. Please use the mic. Hi. Thank Hi. you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, 
Uh, I want to ask you about uh, using async I/O and UV your your event loop, uh, not for high performance but for high concurrency. Do you have any any? Uh, ha, would you use it for high concurrency? Of I have course. An, a scenario with uh, hundreds of thousands of concurrent connections, but uh, yes, UV loop is even better for that because it uses less memory. Uh, than async I/O. Uh, Don't hear you. Ah, UV loop. UV loop is much better for a uh, highly concurrent uh, application that handles like hundreds of thousands of connections, simply because it uses less memory. Uh, it's 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 uh, again it's faster. We we tested UV loop with uh, 100,000 connections and it handles it's it's pretty 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 okay. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Thank you. Thank you.